For now, we know of only one planet that could be easily inhabited by beings like ourselves. That's Earth. Yet our Earth was not always a habitable home for life. Early in its four and a half billion year life, it was nearly destroyed after a collision with another planet, Theia, that ultimately formed our moon. Since then, it's been bombarded with comets and asteroids that caused regional or even global destruction. The most famous of these impacts doomed the dinosaurs and thereby gave mammals a chance to inherit the globe. Less spectacular impacts mattered too. Some scientists believe that a small asteroid smashed into the ice sheets of North America just as the last ice age was beginning to wane. In an instant, ice became meltwater pouring into the Atlantic in such quantities that oceanic circulation shut down. The result? A millennium-long cold period across the Northern Hemisphere that many human populations only narrowly survived. The threat to life has not only come from beyond Earth, it also originated within our planet. Immense volcanic eruptions, for example, have caused climate-altering devastation whether slowly through the gradual release of warming greenhouse gases across thousands of years, or suddenly in explosions that abruptly cooled the earth. Some 70,000 years ago, our ancestors coped with the eruption of Mount Toba, an explosion far more powerful than we could create with all our nuclear weapons put together. Gentler but equally irresistible forces have also created and destroyed life on our world. The leisurely migration of tectonic plates rerouted the circulation of the oceans and lifted up mountains that scrape warming gases out of the atmosphere, transforming Earth's climate. Cycles in Earth's orbit and rotation, occurring over thousands of years, allowed glaciers to cover most of the planets or recalled them back to the poles. Sea levels surged and subsided, at times permitting and at other times constraining the migration of early humans. We became human biologically and culturally as we struggled to adapt to these enormous changes. Life, including human life, has long created and destroyed the conditions for habitability on Earth. Two billion years ago, for example, cyanobacteria for the first time infused Earth's atmosphere with oxygen. The planet probably cooled in response, so much so that ice may have covered its entire surface. Today, we are transforming our Earth. We have become one of the great forces of nature to such an extent that many scientists now believe we live in an Anthropocene, a geological epoch defined by our power over the Earth. Every year, we release billions of tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, warming our home to heights unprecedented for millions of years. It remains to be seen whether we will awake to that threat that we have created to our own survival and change our ways before it's too late. So good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Paul Vuzin, the Earth and Planetary Science reporter here at, uh, at Science Magazine, which means I cover the solar system. But I also spend a lot of my time thinking about topics here on Earth, like climate change the, and the retreating Greenland ice sheet behind me. And I'm joined by an esteemed panel today. Uh, first, Ellen Stefan, the Undersecretary for Science and Research at the Smithsonian Institution and NASA's former chief scientist. Uh, Chris House, the Director of Planetary System Science at Center at Penn State, and John Brook, an environmental historian and Director of the Center for Historical Research at The Ohio State University, who also wrote, I was thrilled to find out a history of my childhood home in Worcester County, Massachusetts. We're here to tackle a simple topic, the deep 4.5 billion year geological history of Earth, the conditions that led to the rise of life in much later civilization, and the demise of us all. So our panelists have a few prepared remarks and then we'll get down to discussion. And if you have any questions for our panelists, uh, please submit them in the Q&A below. Uh, Ellen, um, let's start with you, please. Sure, thank you so much. And it's really a pleasure um, to be here today. And I really apologize. I'm gonna ha I have a hard stop at 1230, so I'm gonna have to leave, to leave early. 
you know, this is this is one of my favorite topics. So I'm really glad we're discussing this here today. And it, it comes from a couple of different things. And Jill really clearly laid this out in, in the video in I think an excellent way. And and one of the things I think it's it's hard to get your head around is in planetary science, which is obviously my background. So that's the way I approach this question. You know, you we talked so much about the habitability zone, right? You know, Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold, Earth is just right, and and you know, life has persisted on this planet because of the stability of the conditions over time, with some little glitches like massive asteroid impacts. But I think if if you if you think of habitability and that habitable zone, it's not just a place. It's not just like oh, it's a distance from your parent star. It can also be a time period because let's go to Venus. All right, early in Venus's history, we're pretty sure that for some amount of time, um, due to looking at the chemistry of the atmosphere, that Venus retained water on its surface. And so Venus had a probably relatively brief time period when life could have evolved. And so did it, you know, as people were talking about in the previous session, did, did life go into the, to Venus's clouds? We don't know. Um, but so Venus could have been habitable for a short period of time. And the question was, was it habitable long enough so that life could have evolved to adapt to the changing conditions, which probably change relatively rapidly? Go to Mars, same situation, right? I mean, now we're looking from perseverance, from curiosity, these amazing sequences of sedimentary rocks. So not only was there water on the surface, but water had to have persisted for some amount of time. And so again, Mars was potentially habitable. Did the conditions persist for long enough for life to have actually taken hold? Some of us think, think probably yes. Some people think probably no. And we're not going to know until we go and crack open enough rocks to actually find out. But this idea of habitability depending on stable planetary conditions that persist over long periods of time to get to complex life so you really have to look at this deep time history of planets and see how they vary. It's not just saying, oh, we found an Earth-like planet around the other, another star. Yes, but, you know, how long has that habitability persisted? Is it stable? Is it widely changing? Can life adapt to it? These are the kind of more complex questions that we have to answer. And just finally, I want to put in a huge plug for our exhibit at the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum called Deep Time. Um, which actually goes through all of those things that Jill talked about, talking about the fact that you can put the climate crisis, you know, planetary crises have happened in the past due to inside forces, due to outside forces, and now this is a new kind of, of crisis that we're in, and it's because of us. Thanks, Ellen. It's a great exhibit. It also has dinosaurs, so there's another selling point. Uh, and now we can turn to Chris. Yeah, thank you, Paul, uh, for the introduction. Also, thank you, Ellen, for laying out the provocative vision that terrestrial planets have a finite phase of habitability. There also might be a finite window of time for the origin of life to occur on a terrestrial planet. The first point I want to make is that um, there's a you know, really long record of life on Earth, over three and a half billion years. The fact that life appears to have risen quickly after Earth formed could either mean that the origin of life is highly probable given the right conditions on a terrestrial planet, or alternatively, it could mean that the origin of life on terrestrial planets requires a young star system, making it only something that can happen quickly um, if it's gonna happen before that window closes. The next striking feature of the record of life on Earth um, is that in spite of dramatic metabolic innovation in the microbial world, it still takes billions of years before the Earth has its first animals. Now there's plenty of metabolic and genetic innovation, methane, production in sediments, uh, oxygen production in photos, uh, during, during photosynthesis, especially in, this, in surface waters, uh, fermentation of organic matter, uh, microbial respiration of iron, various sulfur compounds, uh, and oxygen. Uh, but it's not until about a half a billion years ago, well, a billion years ago and then a half a billion years ago that we see animals and then ultimately half a billion years ago, complex ecosystems with animal predators, animal prey, um, resulting in trophic levels. So, you know, why did it take so long to get animals? It's puzzling, but we can conclude that in spite of a remarkable level of innovation by microbes, for billions of years, the Earth had essentially no indication that intelligence or technology was even possible. Um, so it's therefore quite possible that the cosmos is full of green slime or, or purple slime or pink slime, you take your pick, 
um, but largely absent of technology. Finally, we see multiple times over the history of our planet uh, of, of dramatic environmental change. The video included the role of meteorite impacts and supervolcanoes, uh, both of which have occurred during, the, the, during hominid history. Um, there's also been dozens of massive uh, basalt flows lasting millions of years called the large igneous provinces. And those drive, you know, drive up volcanic gases in the atmosphere, they alter climate. Um, and the most recent was perhaps the Columbia River salt, so about 10, 10 million years ago. Uh, humanity hasn't had to deal with one of these. Um, but, you know, so overall there, there's in the past times of steady long-term change, as well as periods of dramatic and rapid change, uh, and perhaps the most dramatic a billion years ago, for example, the earth had two extreme glacial events with sea ice going from pole to equator. Uh, and getting out of one of these snowball Earths is perhaps even more dramatic as, as the greenhouse gases from uh, volcanic eruption not being balanced by, by, uh, by weathering goes up to really high levels. You, uh, you can dramatically pop out of one of these events going from global ice to global tropical conditions in, in essentially a geologic instant. So the lesson for huma humans may be that really, you know, to, that we really do need to tread lightly on the Earth as rapid warming is possible due to various tipping points in our in our geochemical cycles. Thanks, Paul. Great, thank you, Chris. And uh, yeah, let's those humans. How do they fit into this deep history? For that, we have uh, John. Oh, you're still muted, John. Uh, thank you, Alan and Chris, for setting the stage. Sorry about the muting. Um, I, I, I'm going to work backward from the now um, to, to back into uh, at least a billion years ago, but, but um, to make the basic point that we cannot tolerate the, as human beings living on a planet with approaching 8 billion people uh, with a very delicate um, as we've seen recently, um, relationships with nature with enormous populations of people suddenly coming or emerging out of nowhere. We can't tolerate the kinds of changes that have happened on the planet Earth in evolutionary time. I mean, there's a basic premise of evolutionary history that in in his transitions from habitability to various levels of inhabitability um, have driven evolution. Evolution is something that is um, uh, driven by the by the the uh, by by stress uh, and the action of genetics, which is which is another little wild card that we really haven't had on the table yet. Um, so we have to think about we have to think about the 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 tension between our circumstances in the Holocene, where we've had essentially uh, CO two uh, uh, atmospheric CO two levels is a good measure somewhere between two sixty and two eighty for ten thousand years, following amazing variation over over huge amounts of time back through the Pleistocene in gigantic uh, gigantic ice age events which in which followed the degradation of the greenhouse world of the early the early Cenozoic um, when we talk about great transitions we can talk about great super uh, uh, super plume events uh, causing igneous provinces uh, that put enormous amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere Simultaneous with the asteroid of um, the dinosaur destroying asteroid, we had this enormous event of um, uh, uh, that that created the great peak of heat and CO2 at the at the end of the um, uh, at the end of the uh, the, uh, the the Cretaceous, uh, leading leading to a peak that then ever since then has been descending into an ice house. We have we are in the ice house. We've been living in an ice house in wildly unstable conditions. And only in the last 10,000 years have popped into a relatively stable Holocene world in which all of agriculture and civilization as we know it uh, has emerged. 10,000 years is a microscopic amount of time. And in the last 150 years, we have popped, really the last 70 years, we've popped the level of CO2 up to levels that haven't been seen for probably, um, 3 million, possibly 35 million years. So we are creating our own instability through the Anthropocene in levels 
that we really can't we can't tolerate. Um, I think I'll stop there. Great, thank you, John. And uh, always, <laughs> when it comes to climate change, it's always an optimistic story. <laughs> uh, so um, let's talk. I'd like to keep this as free flowing as possible. Hopefully, you hear from me as little as possible. I have a few questions to just start directing, but uh, I might direct it to one person. But feel free to jump in as well. Uh, so, John, staying in the geological present, but you know, going just back just a little bit to the mm -hmm. Pleistocene, the last time we came out of the Ice Age, and you know, our ancestors, maybe you know, who knows when they uh, in North America came came over to North America, <clears throat> but uh, just what lessons can we take from you know the adaptability they had then, and you know, do we retain any of that, or our, our technological civilization, our cities? I mean. You know, what, what can we learn from that, if anything? Well, I mean, you have to keep in mind that, that modern humanity had, um, had reached a, a essentially modern intellectual skills um, you know, probably 100,000, 150,000 years ago. Um, uh, but the, the conditions of instability surrounding them were such that there really were decisive events that that even even those abilities couldn't couldn't resist. Uh, there, there were you know massive massive um, natural events, uh, uh, droughts that that would kept population down to probably maximum three million people. So one of the sort of the sort of striking features of the of the early Holocene is, I mean the archaeologists say it happened slowly. It took thousands of years, but in geological time, it happened instantaneously. Agriculture emerged out of the the already existing abilities, um, and so clearly, uh, you know, we are building on the technosphere that our you know Upper Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic, Upper Paleolithic, and Neolithic forebears established um, and and taken them to a massive new heights. I mean, the, the levels of innovation that that are going to put us into uh, into space or have put us into space um, are uh, phenomenal relative to the to that that past. But you can see continuities in in uh, you know, rising to challenge. OK, and uh, <clears throat> Ellen, I, you know, I thought now to kind of jump way, way back. Uh, you know, you mentioned these kind of phases of habitability that uh, Venus and Earth or Venus and Mars had and, you know, their endings, uh, you know, what can we learn about how the habitability on Earth uh, may end <laughs> from these two planets, these two uh, sister planets? And, uh, you know, and a kind of more high concept question of if you transpose humanity of today, all of our means onto these planets and their kind of habitable optimum, uh, you know, assuming we didn't get bombarded out of existence, you know, could we halt those environmental changes that, you know, rendered them uh, uh, inhabitable? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, right? And, and there's been some interesting um, chat in the, in the room about this concept of the habitable zone, because of course, when you, when you think about the fact that there could be life under the, under the ice on Europa, Enceladus, maybe even on Titan, but that's not the kind of complex life that, 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 that Chris talked about, right? And so if, like us. And, and so if you think of you need a planet that has life that could persist on the surface to allow it to persist long enough to get complex enough to move towards technology, it's that stability of conditions. And I think if you look at what happened to Venus, probably a little too close to the sun, um, maybe a little different chemistry. We really don't know. That's why we need to go back to Venus and make a ton of measurements, which we're doing with two new missions, which we're really excited about to get at you know, how did Venus have habitable conditions? How long did they persist and what caused them to go away? Still open questions there. On Mars, it's a little clear, right? Mars is a little too small, cold. It's dynamo died, it lost its magnetic field. Solar wind starts stripping the atmosphere. That's not anything we can do anything about, right? It's just, that's like, okay, you don't recover from that. But I think what we've learned from looking at the atmospheres of Mars, the atmosphere of Venus, the atmosphere of Titan, this comparative climatology um, that we can do has certainly shown us, you know, atmospheric conditions can change. Life, as we talked about, can cause atmospheric conditions to change for the better when oxygen was produced, and now for the worse as we put too much CO2 in the atmosphere. And so again, the, the planets set the context to me of what's happening. 
But no, a lot of these conditions tend to be irreversible, which is why I think for many of us, it's so frustrating to see us doing this to ourselves. Because, you know, the earth is, you know, there's no planet B. The earth is, is, is where we can live. And the fact that we're taking an active role in, in disrupting that is, is distressing. And we've got to turn it around and we've got time. Chris, uh, thinking of the kind of origins of life here on Earth, you know, what's the current thinking on how life began here? What was kind of both the environment, you know, that might have kind of cradled the development, and you know, how how did that happen? I know there's debate, of course, is not a settled answer there, but uh, and you know, are, how many different kind of conditions could you imagine that might you know end up in this kind of present state? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great question. I mean, it it's a great question because it's still the one of the great un unanswered questions in, in science. Um, you know, the reality is we don't, we don't exactly know how light, life began. And, and you say there's debate. I mean, there's actually like a pretty major schism in origin of life field that goes back decades. And it changes, you know, depending on which decade you look at, the, the exact schism is, is different. Um, right now, it, it would sort of be um, couched as, do you need a replicator first? Are you trying to get a gooey molecule that, that, that can, you know, um, has information involved with it, or are you trying to get metabolism first? Where you're thinking about a connection of of interreacting, um, you know, complex re reactions in, in some sort of pool or or um, vesicle. Um, and so, you know, those are all technical, you know, rather technical debates. And and but for the, for this particular audience, I think the take home lesson is that um, that a lot of the, a lot of the basics still exist. That that you know we know we need we need. Uh, a medium like like water doesn't necessarily probably have to be water. When you look at Titan, there's other options. Maybe a ethane, methane ocean might work, or um, or you can get more creative. Maybe pools of sulfur on Io. I, you know, I don't know, but um, you definitely need a liquid medium, and 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 you need um, you need for as life as we know it, you need carbon, and so these, that, that may be why the solar system is early on is a great place to do it because there's lots of uh, CO and CO2. Uh, you know, swirling around and, and, and on planetesimals and on, on early planets. Um, but, I, but, you know, I think the field's also very optimistic about looking for life in Europa and Enceladus under the ice. Um, and and that, that would be a very, you know, that would be more of a hydrothermal origin, which is quite possible. So I think all those options are still on the table. And, um, and it may turn out be, to be a probable event that happens whenever you have energy and, 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 uh, and water. But on, on the converse, we know plenty of meteorites, plant parent bodies had plenty of water and plenty of energy and, and didn't form life. So it's, it's, a, great, it's a great problem. And, and I think we're at the threshold of learning a lot about it. And now for, for any of you, um, you know, looking at the kind of chain that led you know, to human civilization, all these kind of different things that had to happen from origin of life to multicellularity, great oxidation event, impacts, et cetera. I mean, what seems like the most unlikely moment, kind of what is the weakest link in that chain up to the present day, not thinking of the future? Um, well, I'll just just launch out there, which uh, I, I haven't I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And what is really very striking is, is I mean, yes, advanced primates were under significant, emerged in, in the, at that, at that or just before the Cenozoic started. Um, but the, the, gen the genetic popping of, of trans uh, transposable elements, I mean, there's something very special that happens in the genetics of advanced primates that is hard to, hard to pin down. I mean, it, why, I mean that's, what, that's what's gonna make the difference. The, this, this process of how the, how the genetics shifted to produce something with an upper story and and that is very much up for grabs um uh and and uh, so the, the the events of roughly five to two million years ago are very very important and and whether the driver of increasing variability in east africa is sufficient to really explain that um is is, is somewhat up for grabs but i don't want to get into other domains here but it's clearly the the genetic the genetic action um, is very, very important. And we don't know quite enough about that. Yeah, I'd agree. And it's interesting because we have some uh, group at the Smithsonian who does a lot of work in East Africa. And, and they recently had a paper come out talking sure. about the uh, effect of climate stress, Rick Potts, Kay Berenger, mm -hmm. and others. 
uh, about the fact of climate stressors and how that helped humans move out of Africa into Europe. And exactly. um, really a lot of interesting work um, going on in that field. But you think, okay, what if the KT impact occurred right at that point? And, and so there's a lot of serendipity to me in this, like, right, we had the KT impact and it nearly crushed us, but we came back from it. And at, at points of stress, there was enough stress to actually spur us to become more complex, mm -hmm. um, as John just talked about, but didn't kill us. And, and, and that balance, which I would argue is a whole lot of luck um, <laughs> and, and serendipity, that's what I find really interesting because it could have been game over at multiple right. points. Right. The most recent one of those is, is there, there's a, a series of articles about geomagnetic reversals and the, I mean, Apparently there was a big geomagnetic reversal at 42,000, which, which was pretty terminal for the Neanderthals, but modern humans made it through. So I don't know how valid this argument is, but it's an interesting new feature of the, uh, it's kind of replacing the Mount Toba argument. Mount Toba is kind of being pushed back as a very important impactor. Now this new geomagnetic argument is emerging. Uh, I, I know that article uh, appeared in Science, but uh, there's a lot of skepticism over from the paleoclimate right. community. Right. 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 Well, I'll also just jump in to kind of reiterate um, what both John and Ellen said, that I would agree that, that the, you know, in terms of what happened here and why is it potentially different, you know, it, it's very puzzling that we got the level of, of, of intellect for whatever reason to, to get to technology. Um, you, you can go pl back plenty of um, back in paleontology, you can go back, you know, plenty of different species that looked rather intelligent. You can look to modern organisms. The octopi is just extraordinary. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, cephalopods go back half a billion years. Um, I think John kind of hit upon it, you know, with genetics. Uh, it's probably, you know, interfering RNA is probably part of the story. Um, we don't really fully understand what interfering RNA is and, and you know, how, why it's so important. But it looks like for one reason or another, an entirely different way of doing gene expression and, and, and you know, and, and controlling, finally controlling gene expression um, arose and arose at a time, like Alan said, of, of, you know, East Africa was doing some, some pretty wild things. So, you know, and, and, you know, in East Africa is a rift zone. We even talked about that. Maybe there, right, maybe right. the fact that it all happened in a rift zone matters. Um, you know, you can see, you know, hominid footprints ac across ash beds, which is just so dramatic. Yeah, right. Oh, you have to wonder about about that that volcanic tectonic context and toxins and that they're simultaneously experiencing the toxins from volcanics and the toxins from a new burning savanna environments the fires big wildfires that are expanding savanna into the forest are creating putting toxins in the air we, we literally those footprints are incredibly important because they they are the symbol of our you know really toxic origins in a certain sense so looking at uh, Earth's kind of deep history and now thinking forward, obviously we have anthropogenic climate change. I mean, is that the kind of current largest threat to human civilization or is it something else in your mind? Is it a nu nuclear war, a supernova, you know, a an impact, uh, a large igneous province coming up in our business? Uh, well, what, I've been, what, what I've are been you teaching, thinking? yeah, I've been teaching, uh, you know, astrobiology for 21 years at Penn State here. And you know, it's funny to, to talk about these tired topics with the students and see what, what they think you know, is going to limit L. Um, and you know, it, it does change over you know, what's going on. If you go further back, obviously, during, the, during when, when Frank Drake gave, first gave the talk at Green Bank, you know, everybody's worried about nuclear war. Um, and you know, that probably got to be the most extreme worry in you know, early 80s. Um, you know, and, then, and I think a few years back, people would have said pandemic. And oddly, you know, this pandemic may, you know, you could take a different lessons from it. You can take a lesson that it's a big, big deal. It's certainly a big deal, but it, but it also, you know, is not a, not a deal that's taking us back uh, because we have such great technology, not taking us back by, you know, a factor of, of two in, in population. Um, so I, I, th I think you need to worry about things that, uh, for this big question of what limits L, you have to be looking at things that, that take population down, uh, you know, a factor of two or a factor of four, um, and they're out there and they're they're geologic, in my opinion. Yeah, I guess I would probably differ. I still think our greatest threat is ourselves. You know, so climate being the primary one, um, where you know we we are right now headed towards at least a two degree world, if not higher. You know, and and we can get back to that one and a half degree world, 
but we're on track for much more than that. And so, okay, is that gonna wipe out humanity? Hopefully not, but it's probably gonna set us back to some extent. And I would argue the numbers could get pretty high if we keep creeping that number outward, upward. So, so that's a, like nuclear war, which is you know the threat I grew up under. You know, we are our greatest threat, and I really wonder about that with advanced civilizations. You know, can you get past your um, your crazy adolescent phase, which I would argue you were in. You know, where we're, we threaten to throw you know large bombs at each other, where we don't think about the sustainability of our planet that we live on being something that's critical. Can advanced civilizations get through that period? Um, and stabilize out where then you can worry about asteroid impacts and then you can worry about large igneous provinces, which are on much, yes, they're there, but they're on much longer time frames and more infrequent. You get a bad one though, you're in trouble. And I don't, and I don't disagree at all with what you said. You do have to get through this, this period of, for, for sure. Yeah, the question is what, what will we look like at 2100? And, 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 the, and the frightening thing to, to, I mean, what is striking is, is how the general public is seeing it, um, that we are, you know, the, the, the scale of, of anthropogenic impacts is accelerating in literally in the lifetime of teenagers. Um, and uh, so it, in terms of, of storm frequency and of, of uh, heat wave frequency. So, you know, and that, that will then have its, is already having its spin outs into into politics. And um, I mean, you could argue that people who are on the Belarusian border right now are in some, some of they're from Syria, they are essentially, ultimately, if you run the causality back, climate refugees of some level or another. We have, we have this enormous issue of climate refugees and the politics of climate refugees and the, you know, the politics of, of shifting, shifting eco zones on the planet, which are not as dramatic as, as, a, as an asteroid or a super plume, but they are here and now, and we can measure them in, in real time. And, and we're actually starting to watch in ways. I mean, I've been teaching uh, global environmental since 1994, and things that I would tell my students in the 90s, you know, keep your eye on this, have already happened. Um, and so, um, you know, we just have to keep that in mind. And, you know, thinking, um even past humanity to some extent, just, you know, what is the kind of, what's the end of the habitable kind of for, you know, all life on earth? What, what is the kind of end game for all life on earth? Well, the expansion of the sun out past the orbit of Mercury is a big one. Um, you know, eventually our galaxy will collide with the Andromeda galaxy. That's a big one too. You know, and luckily, you know, I, I sometimes tell that to, you know, fifth graders. And then I remember, oh, right. You know, I'm going to get all these calls from parents saying, you gave my kid nightmares. You know, I mean, those things are going to happen, right? I mean, this planet will be destroyed as the sun expands. We will collide with the Andromeda galaxy, but that's like over 10 billion years down the road, 9 billion years down the road. So it's not anything we need to panic about. But this idea of how do you become a multi-planet species? How do you get your technology to get up to the point where you can leave the solar system? We have billions of years to worry about that. I'm not worried about it. If we can get past our adolescent phase, if we can move through climate change, if we can learn how to, as somebody in the chat was saying, really say, you know, we're in this together. How do we get spaceship Earth to be successful? And then how do we eventually, eventually move beyond it? Um, and again, I never want to give anybody the idea that that's, that Mars is our escape from climate change. It isn't. We need to fix climate change right here, right now. John, you know, looking at kind of, you know, thinking of uh, the need to mitigate climate change, is there, looking at human history, you know, is there any events or actions that kind of give you hope about humanity's, you know, ability for collective action to kind of tackle climate change? It's not, you know, not necessarily global, but even kind of regional or, you know, anything like that that you look back to. Well, we're putting an awful lot of, increasingly we're making demands on history and our forebears that are a little unreasonable in as much as they never encountered uh, uh, issues of this scale. And we, we are, we can't really, you know, we go back to my, when I was born, the population of the earth was about three and a half billion people. Um, so we're talking about a rapidly changing, massively changing context. And, and it's hard to, 
place at the place the so so do we want do we want to find examples i mean i'll i'll be very specific i would say the montreal um accords and and the refusal to use um right guard by my point to in the 1970s if you look at the at the anti-cfc um boycotts and then the then the national agreements cfcs tip over and then drop um now they were it wasn't perfect but it was collective political action at the, you know, at the social movement level, and then at the national and international level that made a difference. So I would say that, you know, we need, we need to think of, of the recent political history, international political history of the 20th century, um, and its abilities, which have just begun to be manifested. manifested. I mean, we're, obviously, we're frustrated by what's happened in, in uh, Glasgow. Uh, how do we how do we advance that process further? But that is that's where the, our hope should lie in in these international agreements and an international action and and combined with you know with action in the streets, social movements. Yeah, I would add the dust bowl. I mean, we did a you know you had you had literally people cleaning you know dust from the center of the country off their windowsills in New York and Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. You know it was nearly dark in the middle of the day because of the dust that was lifted because of poor agricultural processes we fix that and for mm -hmm. example agriculture is one of the big things we need to tackle with climate change and so mm -hmm. we've shown we can address problems the problem is they're across all sectors and we need to act rapidly but we've done it chris do you have um you mentioned cephalopods uh you know if uh not to be too glib, but if human civilization is wiped out, do you have a bet on the next species? <laughs> no, I, I really don't. I mean, I, I, I'm, I find it very puzzling that that uh, you know a cephalopod or octopi, you know, has been you know been around for so long, because the, the simple answer is oh we have the opposable thumb, you know, or whatever. But the reality is the octopi tentacles make our opposable thumb like look like a you know really uh, primitive so so you know I, I i don't have i don't have the answer but but i you know maybe it's that that the the octopi life cycle just doesn't work you have to spend so much of time as a as floating around the ocean as as a as a little uh you know tiny little thing that knows nothing there's no parental um you know transmission of information maybe and that may be part of the problem but no i don't have i don't have a good bet I, but i i think it's us you know I and mean, that's what i was kind of saying earlier that even though I completely agree with, with with Ellen and John that we have to fix this problem, that, that's our best bet. But you know, if there is a collapse, um, you know, it's still us. It's just us collapsed and set back a ways. Um, and I, you know, I think the real problem could be that we we're using up resources that that are going to be critical. Like like for example, helium. You know, he, helium is mo mostly treated as a byproduct of natural gas exploration, and yet it's super critical for high end. Um, you know, technology and space flight and, and, and uh, fusion reactors or fission react, you know, whatever, whatever we can imagine that's going to solve the problem, helium is probably part of it. And yet, you know, we either release it to the atmosphere when our natural gas prices are, are at certain levels or, or, we, or we do capture it because uh, the market gets good enough for it. Um, you know, and so, so the, the, there's concerns here that, that, you know, it would be us, but, but that we might have already messed things up um for the for for the next us if you will so you know one thing i think about in uh tackling climate change is you know if we're able to kind of get our handle on the global thermostat you know from that point on it's ours right there's a you know we are kind of setting the terms of the planet and then, you know i'm wondering if we are able to do that you know what does our kind of you know l signature look like then or you know is this I mean, what does the planet look like in kind of a sustainable, you know, if you were kind of looking at it from afar, you know, it's kind of the concept here. I mean, you'll have a lot of land draped in solar panels. I mean, there'll still be kind of differences. And, you know, how do you think or envision kind of what Earth might be like if we have, you know, addressed climate change and you know, mitigated it? Well, one of the things I want to say is, is it's not just climate change, right? Because if you look at to the, the fact that we're in this mass extinction right now, it's being caused by, by other human activity besides climate change, whether it's the fact we move harmful microbes around, uh, around the earth at the speed of aircraft, whether it's the fact that we're encroaching on habitats around the world, 
um, and leaving wildlife less and less, but right, we're, biodiversity is in a crisis and it's not just climate change. So as we're fixing climate change, we really need to think about Earth's sustainability. We need to think about things like a circular economy so that we can say we need to, you know, we run out of every year, we run out of Earth's resources. I think the date keeps moving back. I think it's early August right now. So we're using more than a year's worth of resources in about 10 months. We need to get that not just to 12 months, but to 14 or 16 months. And again, it, it depends on things like developing circular economies and really thinking about the fact that we need to learn to live with nature rather than in opposition to nature the way we do now. Great. Well, I, I think um, you know this might be a good time to turn to audience Q and A. Maybe we can get a quick a question to you, Ellen, before we have to go. Um, is that uh, Dagmar? Did... Yeah. Um, let's get started with none other than uh, Jill Jill Tarter. Um, Jill has a question. Yeah, Ellen, I was delighted to hear you use the phrase technological adolescence because I don't hear it anywhere outside the walls of the SETI Institute usually. But my question to you is, is there anybody in Congress that is thinking in these terms? And is what is the, you know, the legislative awareness? Because it's going to have to go there to find some solutions. Yeah, and I think we all see, thanks, Jill, and hi, Jill. Um, I, think, I think we all see at this point that the solutions can't just be individuals, right? We can't, we can't recycle our way out of this. We know that for sure. And my electric car isn't going to solve the problem. So individuals do need to make action, and I'm not putting that down. I see much more movement on the corporate side, where you see a lot of companies seeing regulation, you know, or water shortage, um, good shortage coming down the road, where companies are actually really leaning forward on what they're doing. Government's moving the slowest. And I think there are lots of people in Congress who actually see what's happening. And the problem is, and we're seeing this play out right now, are, are we gonna get enough of a consensus to move this forward and is it gonna happen fast enough? And if it's not gonna happen fast enough, um, what can we all do as individuals? And I always tell people the most important thing you can do about climate change is vote. I always tell people exactly the same thing. <laughs> so that works out well. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm also interested in, in this notion of an adolescent phase, the idea, right, that humanity evolves towards higher states and has evolved towards higher states over time. I think this is a very common notion in SETI. Um, and as a historian, I always kind of have some, some, some trouble with it. And I'm, I'm wondering, where does that come from? And uh, can we trust that notion? <laughs> It totally comes from Star Trek. I mean, at least that's my opinion. And I love that, right? And that's not bad because to me, science fiction is where we play out our possible futures. Um, plugging the futures exhibit at the Smithsonian. You know, how do, we, how do we explore, you know, we have agency in the future and the way we imagine futures is by walking through them through the arts. Um, and that's critically important. And I'm really sorry, I have to go everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Ellen. I would, I would suggest that Steven Pinker's uh, focus on cultural evolution, making us kinder and better than we've ever been in the past, might be one of the agencies that is driving this um, moving to a better state. John Brook, as a historian, how, how do you feel about this notion? <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, I, it's, it's a contest. I mean, you know, I, I'm sitting here thinking about the, about the kind of the driver of, of hominin evolution, which actually was something called, which the, the anthropologists are calling competitive scavenging. Competitive scavenging meant people, people, early hominins were shifting to using tools and communications to talk to each other in little small bands to to scavenge off the herds that they followed and to fight off the hyenas. I mean, there is a certain amount of that still in us. And we talk about rising to higher levels. We have to overcome the kind of tribal um, basics that reemerge very quickly when we aren't, you know, when we don't have access to, to, um, to, uh, to, you know, a refined discussion, <laughs> to put it quite bluntly. Um, so you know, uh, we have this. We have we have you know our tr our tribal um, uh, violent 
backdrop is not that is not that is still embedded deep in our genes and it's it's hard to it's hard to break it break out of it um, so we can talk about a kind of kinder and a better world now on the other hand people have been working for, i mean we, i i just finished a lecture on the 1850s and the transition to the civil war which is simultaneously tribal but also but grounded on the framework that slavery should end uh, slavery should come to an end, a human, humanitarian vision. And it really, there is a history of humanitarianism that is that is embedded, that drives much of our kind of thinking, of ability to empathize with other people and to think about think about our circumstances beyond our immediate interests. Uh, that has been evolving and sh shifting and changing a lot of what history does, um, and historians do for looking at the last Three to four hundred years is the emergence of that empathy quotient, and um, so we are asking for you know a, a planetary empathy quotient, and a lot of people have responded. Perhaps not enough. There's also just to quickly add a, a way to harness human competitiveness for climate mitigation. And a good example of this is the U.S. European steel deal, which mm -hmm. will hopefully ratchet up. You know, it's essentially trade protection, protectionism, but with a climate veneer that you can act in a form of what Bill Nordhaus calls a climate club, where you can actually put these pressures uh, to on other countries that they're out of the club. They want to get in, get out of these trade protections to uh, mitigate climate change. I want to point out that uh, Catherine Denning uh, who is an archaeologist at York University has a point here in the, in the comments that Carl Sagan uh, is an originator of the concept of technological adolescence, uh, who was, of course, very concerned with global thermonuclear war and nuclear winter. Uh, he was part of the team that came up with the nuclear winter concept. Um, I would actually argue that it comes even earlier than that. Um, uh, I'm a historian too, and I started working on early modern history at the beginning of my career. I think it comes from the notion that um, civilization is more modern and superior, so-called civilization, right? Often that meant European Western civilization to uh, other kinds of uh, ways of organizing populations. Uh, and it kind of originates, I think, from a pretty problematic history of thinking of the world societies as being at different levels of development. And so I'm, I'm a little bit concerned with that concept. I'm not sure we're that much um, further developed, superior, um, evolved than um, populations from thousands of years ago. <laughs> so as a historian, that kind of, that makes me uh, worry a little bit, that, that concept. Um, uh, Chris, do you, do you want to talk about that too, or should I move on to the next question? Well, I was just going to say, we certainly are more populous. <laughs> that, that, that's <laughs> that's <for> sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, more populous. We have, we have powers and technologies that I, I, I guess our ancestors uh, never would have, um, but also problems that they never that they never encountered. John, go ahead. Well, just just the, 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 that it's e this is a kind of a truism in American political history. It's easier to uh, when all boats are rising, it's easier to to be empathetic with other people. And when the boats stop rising, when people stop getting access to cool new stuff and meaning they have less money, um, you have a rising tensions. And so there is this in, internal dynamic of you know, contradictory dynamic here, which is the benefits of technological civilization spread widely lead to social peace, but they lead to ecological devastation. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that is the Anthropocene, that is the great acceleration. And you know, the great acceleration stalled um, in a certain sense, um, perhaps because so many people uh, expired to it. Uh, and um, and we have we have uh, we have you know the raw tensions um, over over access to things um, and spilling over into raw tensions between people. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, let me see here. There's a, there's a number of questions um, in the Q&A section. Um, how long will the resources, so Raymond Merrick asks this, how long will the resources of Earth last humankind? How long could the resources of the asteroids last us? And would they have enough of what we need? So a question of, uh, hey, what if we keep on using those resources? We keep on expanding. We don't turn into the um, monks that uh, Mike Wong uh, 
uh, mentioned earlier, <laughs> earlier today, what if we keep on expanding? Is there enough for us in the solar system and for how long? Well, I, I think that go, uh, going back to what Michael Wong said, I think he hit it right on the, the nail on the head that it all depends on whether we massively adopt solar. You know, I mean, sure, there's plenty of metals in the ground. There's, there's metals on the seafloor. There's metals under every igneous province um, on the planet. There's metals in the asteroid belt, but you probably don't even need to go to them, um, at least not in the short term. You know, and it all comes down to really energy. You, you, you can do a lot with different materials. You, you know, you tell an engineer, I want to change the structural piece. I don't like the fact that we're using copper. Okay, fine. We'll use silver. We'll use nickel. We'll use cobalt. I mean, you can change out materials very easily in, in engineering, but it all takes energy. And if you don't have the energy to do it, then engineering becomes extremely hard. And, and so he, uh, he was correct in saying that, that the game changer here is how much we adopt solar um, and other uh, sustainable energies. Uh, but solar goes right to the heart of the question being asked because it talks about asteroid mining and all that sort of stuff. All of that would be, again, so similar, similar um, reasons to go out and get the metals you need to, to, to build big arrays. And I mean, if you, were, if you want to go to sci-fi, you're going to Dyson clusters and whatnot, or, or constellations. You know that's all going to be metals and, and materials, which we have. We have them on the Earth. We have them on the Moon. We have them in the asteroid belt. Um, but it all comes down to the energy. The sun gives us plenty, but we uh, we we seem, seem to still, you know, we 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 got hooked on fossil fuels, and we sold ourselves the idea of, of natural gas getting us off coal. But that is really only a very small step. We've got a long way to go. And uh, to the point of a lot of, even without the reconciliation bill passed, there are a lot of states that have already, you know, very generous feed in tariff policies or solar supports. A lot of states don't have it too, but, uh, you know, there's action that can be taken, uh, you know, right now uh, if people want. Yeah, it, it really can't be stressed enough that the plummeting costs of renewables solar and wind are primarily responsible for steering us away from the most apocalyptic scenarios for future climate change, which is where we seem to be heading even a couple of years ago. Right now, things seem <laughs> more optimistic, which means, well, okay, maybe not abject apocalypse, but we're headed for a very bad place. <laughs> right. But and, 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 you know, of... Within the last 10 years, that changed, right? I mean, I think 10, 10 12 years ago, Absolutely. we were all sort of shrugging our shoulders. I don't know what the future is. I don't know how to make it you know, I kind of know that I'm going to live in a, in a future sci-fi movie, but I don't know which movie. <laughs> and so, you know, at least now we know we have an option to make it an optimistic movie because the technology exists and it exists today and it exists fairly inexpensively. We might get to a Kim a Stanley like Robinson world. <laughs> Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson, yeah, maybe to me it seems a little bit like Blade Runner, but uh, <laughs> hoping for a Star Trek future. Fingers right. crossed. Um, uh, another question here um, is about carbon capture. So the carbon capture that is going on now, what state is the carbon in when it is stored underground at some point in the future? Could all this carbon come back to haunt us? This is a question, a rather technical question, I think. Um, but do any of you feel like you might want to comment on that? My understanding of this new Iceland technology is that the new uh, the new work that we've done in Iceland, uh, the new the new carbon capture systems are creating in totally inert rock forms um, that from which it would take eons to get the carbon back out. But I, I defer to Chris. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, uh, carbon capture and, and um, well, there's two different types of carbon capture, right? Carbon capture from point sources, that's the way to retrofit something you can't give up. Like, and, and you know, we can basically give up anything, but not politically, we can't. So politically, if there's something you can't give up, then, then, then point capture is, is going to help. But, um, but the point about, yeah, the stuff in Iceland, that, that's the way you, know, you ultimately deal hypothetically with the inability to get to zero, right? You, get, you can't get to zero because you just can't give up your gas range or you can't give up your, um, you know, the, flight, the flights. And the flights will be some, bio, maybe bio, bio, biofuels can do a lot, but biofuels compete with food. So there might be limits to what bio, biofuels will do in the terms of airplane flight. But, you know, in this, you know, we're making up our sci-fi movie here, jumping to that sci-fi movie, you know, you have, let's say 90% of, of flights done with biofuels 
and you have still people using gas ranges or, or restaurants using gas ranges, they'll still be, we won't be quite at zero, right? And it, all electricity production could be renewables um, or some mix of, of, inner, of uh, nuclear. You get to a point where you still don't get to zero. You just can't quite get to zero. And unfortunately, we have to get to zero. And so that's where you know capture, capture uh, and, and sequestration into volcanic, um, you know, deep, deep aquifers and volcanic terrains actually might be quite useful. There's also, um, you might want to get below where we are, you know, look back down even further because you keep kind of one degree Celsius long enough, you probably still lose the West Antarctic ice sheet. Yeah, I think historically there was workshops in this, you know, I don't know the years, but, you know, 70s or 80s, just, you know, deciding what is the optimal amount of CO2 for the atmosphere. This is, of course, before it was anywhere near what it is now. And, you know, those workshops were thinking about like, how much you know extra um, farmland you get in Siberia, for example? Um, now, of course, you're making Mexico kind of unhabitable, but but you know, apart from the ethical issues, there were these kinds of workshops, and I think that the consensus was 400 ppm, which we've already blown past. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point, Paul. That uh, a lot of times people assume that okay, when we reach two degrees Celsius, that's it; we're stuck there forever. But with negative emissions, right, carbon capture, it offers at least the potential of reversing some of that. Not all the impacts of climate change, right, melting ice sheets will continue for a long time, unfortunately, centuries. But uh, if we can get CO2 levels low enough to sustain a much lower temperature, then there is some hope uh, for the long-term future as well. Um, okay, so maybe just a couple more questions. Um, this is a very specific question. Uh, by Ryan Wyatt. And I think, John, this, this one might be for you. Um, I'm wondering if there are references for the primate RNA topic that the panel has been discussing. So, well, there are, yeah, I mean, why don't, um, I'm not going to go into them right this second, but there's a vast array of, of a vast literature on the RNA side, but particularly the, the transposable element um, uh, literature on on which which the RNA plays a role in, um, and um, I I'm not going to conjure up the actual citations right this second, but I'm happy to con consult. Uh, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, my my my, my email address is brook10 at osu.edu. Um, well, and, and I think, John, you've got a number of references in your books too, right? So a rough Well, journey. yeah, but the, 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 I will put in a pitch, which is I've just writ, written the, the uh, first two chapters of the revision, which are radically new. Uh, so <laughs> hang on to your hats. It's going to be a, a whole new ride, a lot, new, a lot of new material. Um, I, I, I would like to get back to our last point, which I, the tone of our conversation in the last few minutes has been uh, assuming kind of a gradual, the, a, a directionality toward 2100. In other words, if we do this, we can, we can, we can bend the curve. We can. We are facing in the Arctic, you know, a fundamental shift. It's kind of like it, 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 the eruption of CO2 and methane that's coming out of the Arctic is a, you know, something equivalent to one of these super plume events in terms of its speed and scale. It may not be quite as big, but it is a big deal. And it may overwhelm, uh, it might, it, I mean, it looks like it is probably on course to, uh, it may be what's behind our acceleration in the last few years. Um, and it's gonna get worse in the, next, in the next 25 years, possibly the next decade. And then, you know, then already people are talking about the other kind of intervention, the, the, the intervention that, that is a verboten word, carbon capture is the most kind of benevolent of geoengineering responses. And there are others and um, cloud seeding and, and um, ocean seeding, uh, iron putting iron filings in the Southern oceans. Uh, to accelerate uh, uh, plankton blooms and CO2 drawdown. But, you know, that's the other side of the, once we have our hand on the thermostat, you know, there's a big question out there right now in the scientific engineering world of when do we, we should be thinking about how to geoengineer and uh, in case we actually need it um, five to 10 years from now. And again, I defer to Chris, maybe as more details. Oh yeah, no, it's a great point, and and I actually wanted just to, 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 you know, correct myself and explain myself earlier when I said the big the big things that could limit L are are geologic. 
I didn't mean to exclude our own trigger of geologic cycles. And so you, you absolutely, absolutely, the, the warming of the Arctic is the scariest thing we're facing. Um, and I kind of agree with you that we, that we, we can do all these, all these changes politically and, and, and change our economy, uh, our energy use, and still end up with a huge warming event. Um, and now that's just a different sci-fi movie will be in the future. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to propose what my favorite geoengineering tool would be because I don't want to get to that world. I don't want to, you know, one, I don't want to be in the world where we're, we have, you know, dikes around all coastal cities and, and the, all the reefs of the world are wiped out, and, you know, and because uh, geoengineering doesn't stop uh, acid, uh, acidification of the ocean, for example. And, and so, you know, I absolutely agree. We may have to cool in order to keep sea level from rising by putting sulfate in the atmosphere or something, but um, we, we, we don't want to take pressure off, off the decarbonization of the economy because we, don't, we also want to address acid acidification of the ocean uh, and, 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 and uh, other effects as well. Yeah, it's, it's really important to know when you see these numbers, right, for the future, 20, 2100, we're on course right now for almost three degrees Celsius of warming. That's a model average. That's the average of a whole bunch of different models that climate scientists are running. It could be significantly more than that. Could be a little bit less, could be quite a bit more. And that's driven by these kind of feedbacks that, that John is talking about. Um, so anyway, and once we do do these geoengineering uh, interventions, if we do, or yeah. if we reduce emissions or whatever we do, we will be masters of Earth's uh, atmosphere and oceans. The Earth will become a kind of human machine. And right. to some extent, I suppose it already is. So. Uh, maybe we should be looking for evidence of that on other planets. Uh, and with that in mind, I will turn it over to Bill. Great. Well, thank you, Dagmar. And thank you, Paul and Chris and John and, and Ellen, who, who had to leave, but fantastic panel. And I think, you know, this was habitability at home. And hopefully this discussion brought home really the, the importance and severity of this issue. That's kind of the point of the entire event today. I think Ellen, you know, put it properly when she said, you know, we are our own greatest threat. From my perspective, this is the defining issue of our time and pretty much everything else that's going on in our planet, however impactful it may feel in the short term, like COVID, these all pale in comparison to the issue of climate change and, and rising global temperatures and, uh, uh, and increased uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And, and so it's certainly our hope that through events like this, you know, the public really begins to get it the politicians really begin to get it. I don't think even at COP26, that was really evident, but uh, I think this, this discussion certainly brought home the, the importance of this issue.